a good weekend? We did. What we about did. you guys? We did. We did. We went to a new restaurant. We had a good time. <coughs> Ooh, yeah. nice. Where did you go? Oh, hey, there you are. This is my husband. I don't think you've met him yet. <coughs> oh, oh, what a cute baby. <laughs> Can I hold on? It's a tiny little word, two letters, one syllable, but sometimes you got to say no. no. There's moments, there's just moments in life where no is a beautiful word. It's exactly the right word. But here's the dilemma. For a lot of people, it's hard to say no in the flow of life. I talk with so many people that just go, I'm just no good at saying no. I have a hard time saying no. And, and they're getting things loaded on them more and more and more to the point where they're overwhelmed and sometimes joyless and bitter and resentful. But I got to say yes. And, and especially, especially if you're, if you're a person who walks with Jesus. And you think, well, I'm a Christian. You know, God wants to be loving and kind. How can I say no? I mean, if there's a need to be met, aren't I supposed to be the one to meet every need in the world? And sometimes the answer is no. I, I think of it kind of like, kind of like a buffet. You know, wh whether you love buffets and love going to them, or whether you religiously avoid buffets, all of us find ourselves at some point sort of standing in front of a buffet and looking at the miles of options going different ways and different stations and all this food. And so you get your plate, and I mean, you might want to, at a buffet, get two or three plates, but that's just not polite. So you just get one plate, you know, and you start putting stuff on, and you go, well, there's a you know, salad, that's a, you know, the healthy option. I always have the salad first. You get a little, you know, a little bit of that there, and you go, oh, they got this barbecue chicken. That looks really good. And you kind of put just, just maybe two or four pieces. And then they got some French fries here, and you go, those are, those are nice. And, and you're moving along, and you go, well, you know, I, I want to be healthy. Okay, so I put that on there. Um, you know, there's that. And, and, and so you just kind of going along, and, and you get to a point, oh, cheesecake. Um, so that goes, that, there's plenty of room. That stays right there. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of going. And, and so at some point, you know, you're halfway down the line in the buffet. And you look, there's still all this food. And you go, I'm in trouble. I didn't plan well. And then like at the end, you see, there's somebody that's like carving prime rib. And you're going, there's no room for it. Now, when it comes to a buffet, it can be kind of funny, and oh my gosh, I didn't plan very well. Here's the problem. When this becomes our life, you know, at, the, at the buffet of life, when we say yes, 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 and then we look, and our plate is so full. We've said yes to so many things that we're overwhelmed, and, and we're joyless, and we're exhausted, and sometimes bitter, because we've said yes to so many things, it's just too much. The reality is, whether you're 14 or 94, we can get overextended. This isn't the way that God wants us to live our lives to the point where we just are overwhelmed all the time. God has a better plan. And that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about how, how do we learn to say no in those moments where we realize that, that we've just, we, we've overdone it. We've overloaded and God has, a, God has a better plan for our life. So I want to pray and ask that God would speak to you and speak to me as we think about this together. Lord, we pray for these next three weeks. As we are together here thinking about the wisdom and the beauty of a thoughtful no, and even more so as we think about the power of a thoughtful, wise yes. Lord, we want to say no to the wrong thing so we can say yes to what matters most in life. We don't want things falling off the plate of our lives especially the things that matter the most. So meet with us, O oh Lord, and speak with us in this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Whether you're young or you're old, it's so easy for our lives to become overloaded. I talk with people that are retired who say, I've never been busier. So I thought when I retired, I could relax. But everybody has a wonderful plan for me to how to spend my retirement days. And can you help with this? Can you do that? And I'm going, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, I guess so. And all of a sudden, man, I'm, I'm buried again. 
And there's a wonderful passage in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. If you have your Bibles or your, your Bible app, you can open up to Mark chapter 1. It's the last third of the Bible. It's called the New Testament. And the first four books in the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those are all stories of the life of Jesus from kind of like different perspectives or different angles looking at the life of Jesus. And Mark is the, is the briefest and the fastest paced of the four Gospels. And in Mark chapter 1, we have probably the clearest picture of a day in the life of Jesus. Through the Gospels, we have lots of things that happened through his lifetime. But in the Gospel of Mark, we have sort of one day. From kind of morning, early day, one day, till the morning of the next day. And so I want you to follow along. If you don't have a Bible with you, just listen and hear the storyline. And see what is going on as Jesus kind of walks through this day. We start in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, that's the day of worship, Jesus went into the synagogue, into the, into the place of worship, and he began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. So stop there at the end of verse 22. First, Jesus is preaching and teaching. So he starts his day in a church setting, in a, in a worship setting, in a synagogue, and he's teaching. He's opening the word of God. He's teaching. So that's great. That's part of, what, part of his day. Then we continue on in verse 23. Just then... A man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. And the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out with a shriek. Jesus is setting people free from spiritual bondage. He sets this man free. So Jesus is preaching and teaching. He's setting people free. And then, and then the, it continues on. News spread about him quickly over the whole region. So look at verse 29 now. As soon as he left the synagogue, so it's the same day. He's now he's leaving the synagogue, moving on through the day. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the house of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And immediately they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her by her hand, and helped her up, and the fever left her. So now he's healing. So, I mean, here's Jesus' day so far. Preaching and teaching, setting people free from spiritual bondage, and now he's healing. So, so then, verse 32, that evening after sunset, so now Sabbath ends, and people can kind of wander around, so people start gathering at the house where Jesus is. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon-possessed, and the whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus helped many who had various diseases. He drove out many demons, but he would not let, let the demons speak because they knew who he was. So now there's this revival that breaks out. It's like this revival. People are bringing, he's, he's healing, and Jesus is speaking and teaching and healing and setting people free. It's amazing. And at some point, it doesn't say, but at some point, everyone went home and everyone went to sleep. It just got late. Because we read in verse 35, and you'll see this up on the screen, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Now it's the next morning. And Jesus did what he often did. He found a quiet place to meet with the Father. God the Son met with God the Father and just communed, communed with his Father. And look at verse 36. Simon and his companions, the other disciples, went to look for Jesus. They went to look for him. And they found him, and they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Why? I mean, everyone in town, they all want you. Why? Some more preaching, some more healing, some more setting people free. I mean, come on, Jesus, you, you did a great job last night. Now how about some more today, right? He says, Everyone's, everyone is looking for you. But watch what Jesus says in verse 38. This is important. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. They're all back in town. They're all waiting. They send the disciples to bring Jesus back. And what does Jesus say? He says, no, I'm going to the next town to preach there and then to the next town. Do you think there were some disappointed people back in that town when Jesus didn't come back? You bet there were. But Jesus said, no. And if you remember, one of Jesus' names in the Bible is Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. The fact that Jesus said no means a couple things. One, it means that God says no. And it also, it also means that it's okay for us to say no. Because when I look for an example in my life, I always look at Jesus first. I don't care about the best person in the world that I know. They're not as good as Jesus. And if Jesus said no, guess what I can conclude? 
it's okay for me to say no. Because some Christians are kind of like, well, I should always say yes because I'm a Christian. Well, Jesus didn't always say yes. And we don't have to either. There's wisdom. In our, he says, I've got a mission. I'm going to the next town. And he stayed focused on that mission. And so here's the question. Why does God say no? Because God does say no to us at times. Why does God say no? And I can give you at least three reasons. There's more than this, but I'll give you at least three reasons why God says no. Number one, because he is loving. God says no because he is loving. Anyone who's a good parent or a good grandparent knows you don't always say yes to everything that's requested of you. When you love, sometimes you say no. Imagine you're sitting around a campfire with some friends, and one of your friends is a little three-year-old. And he's kind of hanging back from the campfire, and he's being, you know, being good. He's not getting too close. But at one moment, this little three-year-old just makes a dash and starts running for the campfire. He looks at it. It looks pretty, and it feels warm for him where he's standing, and it's crackling, and it's kind of fun. He's going to go grab the flames. It's kind of neat. He's gonna, and, and as this little boy starts running for the flames, everyone around the campfire says the same thing all at once. No! Stop! Why, why do they do that? Because they're mean. Because they want to ruin his fun, right? Wrong! They say no because they love this little guy. They don't want him burned. They don't want him hurt. They don't want him, you know, they don't want him to be, go through that pain. God says no because he loves us. There's times there's things we want or we think we want, and God says you don't even know how that's going to burn you. I love you too much. The answer is no. Why does God say no? Somebody says no because he's wise. Just because God is wise. He, he sees the big picture. He sees all of life. He's God. <laughs> He's wise. And there's times we pray for things that we think we want, we think we got it all figured out, and God says no. I remember when Sherry and I left uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan area, we lived there for 20 years. We'd actually bought a home there. We paid it for 20 years. We paid a little bit ahead on time, so we actually had paid off the entire house. So when we moved here, we were able to sell that house and take all the money from owning that entire house and have less than enough for a down payment in Monterey. Um, <laughs> But it was a start towards our down payment. And so, so, so we start looking for a house. And it's hard. It's hard. Living here is expensive. So we're looking around, and we found a place that, was, that looked like we could make it work. And we we're like, this is the place. We're excited. Oh, Lord, thank you. This looks like the right place. We pray this will all work out. And, and the door slams shut, and it doesn't work. And through all the circumstances, God says no. And we're kind of we're discouraged and kind of depressed and felt bad about it. But, but that was okay. So another house came up. And this one was actually in the Crawley Tierra Valley, right along the road there. And it was actually, it was like crazy. It was like more than four times the cost of our house in Michigan. But we could like make it work if we, and then, and the colors inside were just the colors Sherry liked. And we're like, it's a sign from Jesus. And we're like, so it's just like, you know, um, it's like, oh yeah, it looks like, this. and we're like, this is it. So we're going, Lord, thank you. And we'll start praying for this one. And we actually gave an offer. And they said, no. And we offered more and they said, no. And then the bank said, we're taking off the market. No. And the door slams. And we're like, well, that's not very good. You know, and, but, but then, when we were looking at that house, we saw this other house up on top of the hill behind that house. We thought, oh, that's kind of a cool house. We didn't know much about it. But then, then our realtor sent a picture. We were back in Michigan, and we were kind of going back and forth. And said, here's a picture of this place. It's up the hill from that one. You looked at it. Yeah, so we, yeah we saw that one. He said, well, listen, it's bank-owned, and it's kind of distressed. And the people that were there before, like, ripped all the fixtures off the walls and tore it up. So it's kind of messed up a little bit. So the price is a little bit lower. And I think we could get this one. And God opened the door. And that's where we live now. But, but there was a no and a no before there was a yes. But God is wise. And we look back now and we're thankful. We weren't thankful for the no's when we got them, but we're thankful now. Why does God say no? Because he's the God of love, because he's wise. And why does God say no? Because he is God. And sometimes he doesn't really explain it to us. Sometimes God just says no because God says, I'm God, I rule and I reign, and the answer is no. I have things I've been praying for for a long time that God hasn't said yes to yet, but I have to try, even though I can't put all the pieces together, I say, God, you're God. I'm not. But we worship a God who loves us, but also who says no. So here's a question for you. When has God said no to you, and you are thankful later? Can you think about a time when you pray, God, I really want this. I really want to do this. I want to experience this. I want to go here. I want to buy this. You know, I want to, you know, God, I really want this. I want this relationship. I want. And then later on, you know, God said no, and later on you look back and you were like, whew. Thank you, Lord. That, you know, there's things that we think at the moment are the right thing, and later on we're thankful that God said no because of God's wisdom. When I think about that, I, I think about my relationship with Sherry. Um, 
when I met Sherry for the first time, I was working at a church in Garden Grove down in Southern California, and I was running the camping and the, the children's ministry for the summers, and so I had this whole group of staff that were meeting with the staff from the ministry she was part of, this camp we were taking all the kids to. And so I'm sitting on the back row as they're introducing all their staff up on the stage, and they introduce Sherry Lynn Vleem. That's her maiden name, Sherry Lynn Vleem. And I look at Sherry up on the stage, and I got my buddy Rick Zeiger sitting next to me, and I just nudged I said, Rick, this is really weird. I think I'm going to marry her. And he says, what's your girlfriend going to say? <laughs> and that's a whole other sermon. Um, but uh, but, but the, the person I was dating at the time, we were at that crossroads. We had been, been dating for about two years. We were talking about potentially getting married. We actually had met with a pastor. We were like at that point, we're, we're either going to move forward and get married or this is going to end. We were like, you know, that, at that moment, right? That point in the relationship. And, and at, God led an ending of that relationship that I, that I thought I might spend the rest of my life in and led me to Sherry. And I thank God for that every day. I look now and say, God, you are, but at the moment, there's a, I thought, you, know, you think you got it right. And, and so we've got to trust God's yeses and trust God's noes. Maybe for you it was a, an occupation you thought you were going to pursue and it didn't turn out where you ended up, where you thought you'd be, but you're in a different place, but God's hand was in that. Maybe God's no to you was a no, a prayer, where somebody did something to offend you or bother you. So you, you got like all, all vengeful and all like Middle English, Old Testament. Oh, Lord, smite thou, smiteth them for their, you know, and you were like, oh, and God's like, no, no, I, I love you. I show you grace. I'm gonna show them grace. But there's times where God just says no, and we have to live in that. So what I wanna do today is I wanna give you two concepts that I really believe will help you look at your life and live a life that will be healthier and better for you, but I believe that can align you with what God wants for you. Because God has better plans for you than you can imagine and better plans than you have for yourself. So two simple truths. You'll remember these after you leave here. I hope you'll remember the rest of your life, but you'll remember them when you leave here. Here's the first one. Every yes is a no. Every yes is a no. I want you to say that with me. If you're comfortable saying it, say that with me. You ready? Every yes is a no. What do I mean? What am I talking about? Okay, every yes is a no. There's a point where your life is full and you've piled your plate so full that you get to a point where anything, if you say, okay, I'm gonna, yes, I'm putting one more thing on my plate and you start, and you start to kind of slide it on your plate and you, you go, okay, there we go, that's all set there. I said yes to my new thing, right? And you go, this is great, I, I fit it on there. But there's a moment when your plate is so full, there's a point where you put something on the plate that something else falls off. And here's the scary part. The thing that falls off or the things that fall off are often the most important things in our lives. And when we take something that's not as important and slide it onto the plate of our lives, something else falls off. You know what I've experienced as a pastor through the years? It's oftentimes a marriage relationship that slides off the plate. It's oftentimes our children, our health, our time with Jesus, we get so busy, busy piling things on our plate that we're saying yes to something that's not as important and something far more important falls off the plate. And we don't even notice it until a week or a month or 10 years later. And, and, and so we have, to we have to just start to recognize when I say yes to one thing, if my life is full, if my plate is full, I'm probably saying no to something else. What am I saying no to? I gotta, be, I gotta look at it and be honest and be prayerful and thoughtful about that. And say, do I want to say, is what I'm saying yes to worth saying no to that? Think, think about a dad. He's in his 30s, married, has two kids, a little, little boy and a little girl. Has a job, pretty full, busy life. And he's at work one day, and one of his buddies says, hey, we're going to start playing. We're starting up this basketball thing. We're going to get together and play basketball one evening a week. You want to play? And he's like, man, I work so hard. I got so, yeah, absolutely. I deserve, you know, sometimes I'm in. I'll play. So he gets home, and during the evening, he kind of off the cuff mentions, oh, yeah, by the way, I was talking with my buddy at work, and some of the guys are going to be playing basketball one night a week, and I told him I'm going to jump in and play that. And she's like, oh, that's great. Uh, you know, she asked a practical question. What night? He gets on his phone, texts his buddy, what night? Hadn't asked, you know, <laughs> what night? Oh, he says, well, Wednesday night. He says, well, honey, Wednesday night's the night that our daughter has dance class, and you've been picking her up from dance class and having like, sort of like a half an hour daddy-daughter time every Wednesday. I thought you loved doing that. So I, I, I do, I do. And, and, says, and every third week, our son has a soccer game, and we've been doing that before you go. And all of a sudden, he's got to go, okay, if I slide this on my plate, that's okay, nothing wrong with playing basketball with the guys, but if I slide this on my plate, am I, am I willing to give up my daddy-daughter time? Am I willing to give up the time watching my... We have to decide. But so often we just keep sliding things on the plate, not realizing that other things are falling off. 
And, and, and so we have to make a decision because every yes, when your plate is full, every yes is a no. If you say yes to hitting the snooze button for 15 more minutes of rest and 15 more minutes of rest and you have a plan to work out every morning, you go yes, snooze button, yes, snooze button, no to exercise. Those yeses are a no to something else. If you decide when you get home after school or after work, and you have homework, you're a student, and you say, I'm going to say yes to just like a half an hour, an hour of some Netflix and maybe a half an hour of video games, and then you know, four or five hours go by, and you fall asleep exhausted and you didn't get your homework, you've said yes to something, but by saying yes, you said no to something else. That, that's just how life works. If you want to buy some new thing, some new toy that you really want, and you got to pay for it over six months or a year, a year and a half, you're saying yes to that toy, but you might be saying no to saving money for your kid's education. I mean, that's every yes is a no. So we need to acknowledge it and say, what am I saying no to in this moment? There's, all, there's always a cost. And here's the reality. Most of the yeses are not bad things. Most of them are either neutral things or sometimes they're really good things. I, I got my whole life jammed up. When my kids, my boys were probably about 10, 8, and 6, right about that age. And through a whole series of things, I was a pastor in a church. And I, I've never, as a pastor, I've been a pastor now for over 30 years. I have never had a day, I finished a day and said, I'm done with everything. There's always more people, more needs, more things, another sermon to write. There's always something. And I, and I had so many people asking me for things. And I just was, I was a yes machine. Oh, yeah, I can help with that. Sure, I can go there. I'll, I'll be at that meeting. I'll be there. And my life had just gotten, my plate had got fuller and fuller and fuller. And we were away on vacation. And actually, I was, took work with me on vacation. Bad idea. And I was working on something. And I, and I made a comment to Sherry because I was reading this one thing. I said, you know, Sherry, I got to be careful. I, I said, I, I, I got to be careful. Or I could end up being back at church and doing church work every night of the week. And she very graciously said, well, you, you do go back to the church every night of the week. And I very maturely said, no, I don't. And uh, she said, she said, I think you do. And so I went and got my calendar. And I had to go back 30 days to find a single night. I hadn't come home. I'd come home often for dinner, but then I'd go back to the office. It's maybe only 10 minutes away. Every night for 30 days. And what I also noticed was this. I hadn't taken a day off, a Sabbath day, for, for 30 days. And God says in his word, every, one out of every seven days, you need to rest or you're going to blow yourself up. And what was falling off my plate was my wife and my kids and my health and even my walk with Jesus. While I'm serving Jesus, saying, but here's the thing. All the stuff I was doing was really good. Pastor, can you help with this? Pastor, can you come over to our house for this? Pastor, can I meet with you on this? Pastor, can... And it, and it was just, I was just, yes, 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 yes. And God said, listen, every yes is a no. And I'm saying no to the wrong things. And so we have to recognize that and deal with it. So here's the question for you. When do you say yes when you should not? When are times when you say yes? And you might be like, I don't even know how to say no. I say yes to everything. Or you might say, well, there's certain things that just feel like, oh, I have to. But when do you say yes? And saying yes is fine if you should say yes. But saying yes is not good if you should be saying no. When do you say yes when you should not, when you should say no? So every yes is a no, and we have to look at our yeses and look at what's going to fall off our plate and look at the consequence of our yeses because all of our yeses cost us something. It's a no to something if our plate is full. Here's the second thing, and you're gonna, this will make sense right away. Every no is a yes. Every time you say no, it's a yes. Let's say that together. If you're comfortable saying it, ready? Every no is a yes. Here's the beauty of no. When you say no to something that you shouldn't be doing, you open up your schedule, you clear off your plate, and you make room to say yes to the thing that really matters. But if you're going to say yes to the right things, you have to say no to some things because we have limited time and limited energy and, and you know, limited days that we get to live. And so I've got to be wise about this. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to, to the book of Acts chapter 16. And in Acts chapter 16, it's a fascinating passage. The apostle Paul and some of the other leaders in the early church are traveling around teaching people about Jesus. A good thing to do. And they're going, so where should we go next? Where should we go next and preach Jesus and share about Jesus? And in verse 6, we read this. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. That seemed like a weird thing to read. They're kept by the Holy, the Holy Spirit. says, it's a divine no. Don't go there. That's not the right place. Not that God didn't love those people. He's just saying, right now for you, that's the wrong place. Don't go there. Okay. Verse 7. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia. They're trying to move that direction. But the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Another divine note, don't go there. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. 
during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. This vision of this man, come to Macedonia. Verse 10, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. They got their divine yes. But before they were told yes, they were told no and no. Because every no is a yes. It's just a yes to something else. And when we choose to say no to the things that may be good or fun or wonderful but aren't the right things, we then create space to say yes to the things that matter the most. But that's a decision day after day after day. I remember years ago, this is 30 years ago now, I was at a time, we were just starting a family. I was working as a pastor in the church. I was working on an advanced degree. I just had a very busy life. And I had a Christian publisher contact me and say, it's actually the publisher that published the book, Know is a Beautiful Word. I've been writing for them for 30 years now. They contacted me and they said, we'd like you to start writing for us. I never planned on being a writer. I didn't have like a goal of being a writer, but they said, we'd like you to start writing for us. And they laid out what they wanted me to do. And here's what I figured out. It was about 20 hours of week, 20 hours of work a week. And my plate was already like, um, you know, my plate was full. Let's just put it that way. So I, I'm looking, so, so they're at, and it's a great opportunity. But I'm like, I don't have any time. But here's what I did. I looked at my plate. I said, is there something I can say no to? See, it's okay to take things off your plate. Is there something I can stop doing that takes 20 hours a week that isn't essential for me? And at first I looked at my life and I thought, there's no, everything I do is essential. I mean, I'm, my life's full. And I saw something, one thing on my plate that I could do, that I could take off, I could say no to. And some of you are going to blow your mind, but I would tell you this, but I'll tell you some of my journey. I looked at my schedule, and here's what I realized. I was spending about 20 hours a week watching sports. I love any and every sport ever in man, invented by man. <laughs> I mean, I, I got pulled into cur the curling during the Olympics when I'm sitting there watching those <laughs> Wee, 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 and they're sweeping and they push around. I was so fascinated. I mean, I can get sucked into any sport at all. But I realized watching sports, reading stats, reading about sports, learning, you know, talking about sports, I, I still, that, that wasn't, I still snow, could snowboard and golf. I, mean, I could play some sports, but I, it was all the spending time. And I thought, if I take that, and don't do this on a real buffet, but you know, if I put it back on the buffet, <laughs> if I put that back, then I would have 20 hours a week to start writing and still have balance in my life. And so, so that's what I did. And you know, that one no has led to about 25,000 no's. Because um, I've had to say no over and over and over and over because I, I just get sucked into I, I, I allowed myself to record Sunday golf and watch that kind of fast forward through Sunday golf, but that's it. I don't know who won the Super Bowl or the playoffs like last year, the year before. I can't, I can't even follow it because it's like a drug for me. If I start doing it, whew, I'm sucked right in. That was the decision. Now, I'm not saying you need to make that decision. There's nothing wrong with watching sports. I'm saying for me, the only thing on my plate I could give up was that. But here's the thing. As much as I love sports, I've grown to love writing. I love writing. I write 20 hours a week almost every week since the last 30 years. That's just a part of my life. And I still, to this day, I'll watch little bits of, I like to watch some of the Warriors catch the very end of the game, but I don't sit and watch like a whole game because I just, I use that time for something else. But, but, and again, for, I had a pastor, a friend, talk to me not too long ago and said, actually said, how do you do all your writing? I just told him the story I just shared with you. Because he really wanted to be a writer. He said, I'd really love to start writing. So I told him the story. He goes, I guess I'll never be a writer. <laughs> He's like, I'm not, I'm not giving up watching my stories. I said, that's fine. But can I tell you what's happened to me in my life because of that choice and because of the thousands and thousands of no's I've said so I can say yes to writing? 20 hours a week, that first week I started doing it, continued on until today. So that's about, about 80 hours a month. That's about 960 hours of writing a year. That's close to 10,000 hours of writing in a decade. It's been three decades. I spent over 30,000 hours writing because of that one decision and the thousands of little decisions to say no again and again and again. But if you ask me what's more important to me, being able to tell you who won the playoffs three years ago or writing a study guide or a book or a Bible study that's helping people in multiple languages around the world, I'll check, I'll check that box every time, right? But it was, it was that decision and we need to make those decisions personally because, because every no is a yes. Every yes, putting more on our plate, is a no to something that falls off the plate. But every no, taking something off our plate, is a yes to the right thing being put on the plate. You get to decide what those things are. And I hope you would make those decisions prayerfully and thoughtfully. 
One last thought. If God says no, so can I. It's okay to say no. You can love Jesus, be a kind person, and still say no. Next week, I'm going to give you a bunch of different ways to say no. I'm going to teach you some ways to learn to say no so you can order your life in a way that's the best. But here's, in the meantime, two things for you. What are some strategic no's I can speak so I can say yes more freely to God? I want you to think about what are some things I can say no to? Is there anything in my life that for me isn't that big of a priority, but there's other things more important? And can I even right now start saying no to some things I shouldn't be saying yes to? And here's the second thing, and this is a, this is a big challenge. Sometime today, especially if you struggle saying no, I want to challenge you today sometime, go somewhere quiet and private, in your car alone, in the bathroom, close the door, and make sure people are a little further away so you can do this well. I want to challenge you to say no 30 to 50 times and get creative. You just go, just go, no, no, thank you. No, back off. You're just gonna have some fun with it, you know. <laughs> say, say, no, I can't believe you'd even ask me to do it. I'm just practicing. Say, 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 no, 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 that's not my thing. No, I'm not interested, but, but thanks anyway. I mean, just come up, just start saying a bunch of no's. Because here's the deal. After the end of these three weeks, you're gonna be saying no more than you ever have in your life. But you will be saying yes to the things that matter the most and your life will become more of what God wants it to be. Lord Jesus, we pray that as we begin this journey of these three weeks, thinking about our lives, Lord, we have, we have one life to live, and we have limited resources and time and energy, but God, you want to maximize who we are for your glory and for our good. And so, Lord, I pray that you will guide us through this three-week journey together. And I pray that each person here will learn to look at their lives and discover that every yes can become a no to something, and we don't want things falling off our plates, and every no can open up space to say the right kind of yes for our lives. And so, Lord, we pray you'll lead us on this journey through these three weeks, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.